Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you for keeping us. We appreciate your word so greatly. Now bless us as we pause to study so that it might bear fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Any questions before we get started? No. All right. <clears throat> We're continuing this study of just the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit works. And so we're taking just a little look at Acts, the, the Acts of the Apostles and how the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and how it impacted people's lives on a daily basis. And so we took a look at several of them. Last week, I think we looked at Philip, um, who was one of the seven deacons who was a Paul, a, um, appointed to wait tables and to look at the food distribution and the way the Holy Spirit worked in his life. Today, I want to take a look at three particular people in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9. I want us to look at Saul, who he was, and how the Holy Spirit impacted his life. I want us to look at Ananias, how did the Holy Spirit impacted his life. And I want us to look at Barnabas. Those are three people Mm -hmm. that we all see here in Acts chapter 9 that were moved, were, were believers, but they were filled with the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit used them in different ways. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. So I know it's a big reading, but we want to look at Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 31. Anybody feel up to reading that much for us this evening? <clears throat> Oh, Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 31. I'll read part of it. Okay. Well, whenever you finish. I'll, I'll read when she's done. All right. I'll, I'll stop okay. at uh, 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 17. I'll read 17. All right. Okay. Okay. Meanwhile, Saul, still, breath still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in the synagogues in Damascus so that he is found so that if he found any there who belonged to the way whether men or women he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem as he neared Damascus on his journey suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him Saul Saul why do you persecute me who are you lord Saul asked i am jesus whom you are per persecuting he replied, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into, into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house on Judah, Judas on Straight, Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done in your saints in, to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Once he began to preach... At once, he began to preach in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. 
All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by providing, by proving that Jesus is the Christ. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him into the brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews and they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted us to read that entire passage because it gives us some insight into the three people that I want us to focus some attention on today. I want you to be really hear how God chooses people from a variety of walks of life, from a variety of backgrounds to fulfill his mission and to bring kingdom, bring the kingdom come in on earth as it is in heaven. All of these people were different. They had different gifts, different strengths, different talents, but all of them were used by God for a particular purpose. All of them fulfilled with the Holy Spirit and used by God for a particular purpose and in this particular passage. And so we want to think about our own lives and our own times. Are we allowing God to use us or are we backing out and afraid of what God might do for us? The first thing I want you to look at is Saul, who later on is renamed Paul. What do we know about Saul? He was a Jew. I heard somebody say he was a Jew. No, persecutor. He was persecuting the Christians. He was a Jewish man persecuting the Christians. What were you saying, Ken? I, I said he was educated and uh, stood in good standing with the power structure mm -hmm. uh, such that he could interact with them, uh, went and got the, the permission to go and, and persecute in the name of uh, the Pharisees, mm -hmm. uh, the, the the yeah, Jewish religious power structure. Mm -hmm. He was a part of that power structure. Anybody else? Well, okay. he eventually gets his name changed to Paul. He eventually <laughs> changes his name from Paul, little rock to big rock. So if you flip in your Bibles over to Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, and I'm reading verse 3, verse 4 here in Philippians chapter 3, where Paul talks about his own life. Verse 4 says, if someone thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regards to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. So Paul had the proper pedigree. He was a Jew of all Jews. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. 
He was from the tribe of Benjamin, mm -hmm. and he could trace his history back to the tribe of Benjamin, and he was able to say that he was a Pharisee. The Pharisee, when Steve, when I, Ken talked about the, 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 the power structure, the Pharisees were at the very top of the Jewish power structure. They were the ones that were extremely well-educated, extremely well-educated. Um, when, when I also reference the scripture in Acts chapter 22, I think it is, where they hear Paul speaking several languages. And so he didn't just speak Hebrew, but he spoke Aramaic, he spoke Greek, and he spoke Latin. He, Paul was educated at the best schools. At one place, the scripture tells us he was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. That means he had the best education he could possibly have. And so he was in he was probably from a wealthy family. That's the only way you can get an education like that. But educated particularly well, strong personality, because he was a Jew and he was a Pharisee and he was a zealot, he said. A zealot was one of those people who were radical, who were out there on the front line saying, you all are wrong. We got to follow the law. And he, he describes himself in Philippians as one who follows, follows the law faultless. That means that Paul had ceremoniously kept himself clean, had tried to follow all the laws that were and the traditions that were followed, that were passed down from the Jewish uh, believers, from the heads of the Jewish church. He did his best to follow those things as well as he possibly can. Did this, he I'm sorry? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Did he change his name so people didn't so they didn't, so, you know, because he was so bad. Did he change his name because he didn't want people to know? Or did he change his name because he wanted to go in a different I, I path, the Christian path, and live the good life? I think God changed his name. Jesus changed oh. his name from okay, Saul Jesus did. to okay. Paul because it, 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 start, it, it was more about what he was going to do for the kingdom. Okay, so Jesus. That, Yes. That. yes. I totally missed that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So his name was changed so that so that he was able to do more work. And so I, I don't have the right uh definition right in front of me, but Saul translates to mean the little stone and, and Paul is a bigger influence that he is having on the church. Okay. Oh, and I thought God was just rhyming. <laughs> no, no, not just, just just rhyming. I don't think that's what God does. But hey, um, I think He has a sense of humor. Oh, He's got a big sense. Oh, of humor. yeah. Um. Well, the thing is, too, is um. Oh, and I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, poo. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my world. No, I was going to say that, you know, that's true of of people nowadays. You know, somebody will get saved, and you know, you hear about it publicly, and then you question, "Oh, yeah, right," like they really are, mm -hmm. you know, because of their past. You mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that sometimes, so that our past doesn't affect our future. Sometimes people will change their names. But when you meet Jesus, your name is changed. Well, he changed all the disciples, didn't he? He changed so, us. He did, well, yeah. But I mean, name-wise. No, he didn't necessarily change the disciples' name except for Peter. It was Simon and Peter. Uh, right. But he his name was changed. And so I think Acts chapter 13, that's the scripture I was looking for, where they show where Paul's name was changed from Saul to Paul. But it, it is an indication of the work that he was going to do. What I want you to see is the kind of person God chose for this big ministry. When we look at the Apostle Paul, we look at all the things he did. He wrote half of the New Testament. He took three missionary journeys where he started churches, big churches and small churches, and evangelized the name of Jesus Christ all across Europe and Asia. 
and the, and the known world at that time. It was Saul's desire to preach Jesus Christ in Spain so that he could reach the far reaches of the, of the Roman Empire at that time. He didn't want any place that the Roman Empire was where Jesus Christ wasn't known. But God selected him, not just because it's some random thing, but he had skills, abilities, and talents that were useful to the kingdom of God. He spoke several languages. So when Paul was moving out throughout the, the, the Grecian Jews or the Hellenistic Jews, he could speak some of their languages. He could speak Aramaic. He could speak Hebrew. And he was able to communicate with many different people in their own language. What better way to get the word of God out there than by a person who has the, who is fluent in several different languages? Paul was a great debater. And so he was well educated and could and knew the scriptures and could use the scriptures to convince people about G as Jesus Christ as, as the Messiah. But one of the things that I think is really fascinating about Acts chapter nine is immediately after his he receives his sight. Immediately after he receives his sight in Acts chapter nine, um, he got up. He was baptized and he began to be to preach the gospel. So there was a knowledge base that was already present in him that God just had to activate with the Holy Spirit. I think when Ananias prayed for him, he prayed that he receive his sight and that he be filled with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit gets a hold of our natural talents and abilities with our own skills and abilities and with our education, he can do great things if we allow him. And I think we can talk a lot about Saul as the apostle and the works that he's done and some of his writings are just phenomenal. And we'll study some of them as the year goes on. But what I want to convince you is today of is that how much God can do with someone who yields all of themselves to Jesus Christ, who submits his body as a living sacrifice to Jesus Christ. So all of his upbringing, all of his education, all of his connections helped Paul Saul move the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the known world. And if he, he didn't was have- was a man with, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I, um, he was a man with uh, uh, physical uh, issues mm -hmm. uh, and, and 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 medical ones, which which never got solved no. uh, to the point where we would think call it solved. Right, right, because he had, and the scripture talks about he has a uh, the the devil came to give him some thorn in the flesh. The other thing yeah. I think that history book tells us that he wasn't tall; he was a short man. Mm -hmm. and not very attractive. But he had physical issues and he had bad eyesight for some reason, I think uh, the, the history books tell us. But all of those things God used. And I think for me, it's, it's valuable for me to know that I didn't spend all those years going to school for nothing God can use my education. I didn't meet the people that I met along the way for nothing. God can use all of my connections and my friends, all the skills and talents and abilities that I have. God can use those things. And I think as Minister Gina just mentioned, I might have some issues. God still gets the glory out of my life, even though I have medical issues, or even though I have issues of the, in the body, all those sorts of things. Even though I may not be the, the the tallest man in the room, God can still use me. Well, and he he didn't let those things get in the way. Exactly. So, um, uh, with all that he that he did, and even after asking uh, for the thorn in his flesh to be removed. Mm -hmm. We don't God. know that it was removed. Mm -mm. We don't have it. Uh, God told him, My grace is sufficient. Yes. And he continued his work until his death. Right. 
That didn't stop him. He ministered while he was in prison. He ministered while he was in the shipwreck. None of those things stopped him. And I think I think it really is, it really shows his resilience and his determination. Imagine the kind of resilience it takes for some person who's in Jerusalem to go to the high priest and get a letter to say, I don't need to go to Damascus and arrest those people who were Christians. He traveled 140 miles to go arrest people. What kind of determination must that have been? He rode a donkey or a camel or a horse 140 miles from Jerusalem to Damascus in Syria. So he went north 140 miles just so he could arrest folks. That shows great determination, great vigor, great zeal. And that's the kind of thing God wanted to use. And that's why he was the perfect person for God to minister to and for God to save and to fill with the spirit so he could change his life and now be an apostle for Jesus Christ. Because when you go, when you look at his life and all that he did, he let anything stop him. He didn't let prison stop him. He didn't let knowing he was going to possibly be killed stop him. He, mm -mm. he used that or God used him. Right. Right. He didn't allow any of those things to distract him. So no. his illness, his issues, his, I think he had been beaten several times. He was shipwrecked. And you remember the story in Acts where he was putting wood on the fire and a, and a, a snake bit him. And he shook the snake off and kept on going. He never stopped. Nothing stopped him. Such determination, I think, is so vital for believers today so that we can not be distracted by stuff that happens in our lives. We all got stuff going on in our lives. Amen. Amen. And we have to work to make certain that does not distract us from the mission God called us to do. We need to figure out what our talents are. He, we need to ask God to show us what our talents are. Mm -hmm. We yeah. all have, uh, yes, I can we... recognize some of those now that I, you know, but we all, we all can do that to maybe not to that extent, but we are, you know, we're all can be strong and determined and, mm -hmm. and, you know, lead the way for other people. I mean, I have so many people in my life that I can minister to in a way, not throw it down their throats, but I need them to see how, how my life mm -hmm. is peaceful and have the joy. Amen. Amen. And you don't, you don't have those friends for nothing. You no. don't have those connections for nothing. God has given us these connections so that we might share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. We might talk to them about what it's really like to have peace because so many people don't have peace. I just had a friend that called me. She's going through a, a health issue. It's about, you know, five years now. And she asked me, you know, uh, I'm mad at God. And I told her, I said, you know, it's okay to be mad at God, mm -hmm. but you also have to be recognized that, you know, a lot of times when you hear of something terrible happening and you think it's terrible, maybe God took that person home because what he was going to face later would have been worse. Mm -hmm. That's how I look at it. Like when a, a child or something, I just feel he takes them home where they're in paradise so they don't have to face what's coming up. If I, I find comfort in that. I don't know if I'm totally off base or, but no, you know. I don't think you're off base. I think God has a plan for all of our lives and who knows what God chooses to do the things that he does, but he does it for our good. The scriptures teach us that all these things work for our good and right. he had a different plan for those people. Right. For their good. For their good. For that, you know, so I, mm -hmm. I 
I guess, you know, in a way I think, you know, I, I showed her encouragement is what I did, you know. Exactly. That's yeah. our gift. That's our, yeah. the thing that right. God has called us right. to do. Yeah. And we're going to keep working on those talents and spiritual gifts that we have so we right. can develop them so we can really do the work God has asked us to do. I thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Recognize also, God, God doesn't point a finger at you and say, okay, I'm going to have you go through this. I mean, circumstances in our lives happen to transpire and he lets them play out and, and for the good, you know, if we go the right way, you know, I mean, I never once, I, and I'm amazed that I haven't done this, but when Rebecca was sick, I never once thought, why God, why did you do that to us? Mm -hmm. Which I'm glad I did. And I'm glad I didn't get mad at him. Douglas did, but I did not. Um, but um, I grew to understand that, you know, when circumstances happen, um, he lets it play out. And I can thank her someday for what we went through because that's how I came to Christ. And I'm grateful. Amen. God has, God has a different plan for our lives that we aren't always fully aware of at the time it's happening. And I'll just say, from my own experience, God can take you getting angry with him. Mm -hmm. God can manage your questions. What he wants us to do is not turn away from him, but right. draw nearer to him. Right. It is in those places where I've had questions that I felt nearer to God because I was able to be honest and say this, I don't like this, or I have questions about this. And he never turned away from the questions. He can handle the questions we have for him. And he's able, I know people say, oh, I shouldn't question God. Well, I think there's some things about God we shouldn't question, but God can handle our concerns. He can handle our issues. All he asks us is to talk with him and allow him to talk with us. Right, and if it helps us understand him more and what we are going through or not going through, um, by all means, um, yes, ask questions. Another thing I think of is like, you know, well, I don't know if you know this. I was close to death a few years ago. I had MRSA and mm -hmm. for six months I was, uh, well, I had four knee surgeries and got MRSA. And I, I just, you know, I was, there was one time I laid in bed and I told God, you can just take me. But mm -hmm. not one time did I ever think that he was against me. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just, he's, and this was before I started coming to church. He was with me the whole time and I knew it. I felt it. And it was like, mm -hmm. it was from my upbringing back when I was a child, all the little stories I heard and my grandfather being a preacher I walked away from the church, but mm -hmm. I never walked away from God. He was always in the back of my mind. Always. Trust me, when I said I was the epitome of a wild child, and he <laughs> never left me. Amen, amen. He never leaves us. No. And I, I think God will, will meet us where we are and remind us that we still have work to do for the kingdom of God and for his glory. Right. Yep. So I, I wanted you to see Paul and saw Saul in his first meetings of G with Jesus Christ. I wanted you to see how God chose him and selected him. I also want you to see how the natural talents and abilities that Saul had were now being used for the good of Jesus Christ. Right. The second person I want us to look at is Ananias. We meet Ananias in verse 10 of uh, Acts chapter 9. And all we're told about him, that in Ananias, there was a disciple in, An in Damascus named Ananias. That's all we're told about him, is that there is a disciple named Ananias in Damascus. What role does Ananias play? 
Well, he wanted, uh, God wanted Ananias to go and lay hands on him so his sight can be restored. Mm -hmm. And Ananias was reminding God, well, he's the one that was persecuting the Christians. Want me to what? <laughs> mm -hmm. So Ananias wasn't the pastor. No. Ananias wasn't a big leader as such. He wasn't one of the deacons. The scripture says Ananias was just a disciple. He was a follower of God in Damascus where Saul was. And the Lord spoke to him. Mm -hmm. All too often people think God is only speaking to one or two people. God wants to talk to all of us. God will speak to all of us. And here we have this disciple named Ananias who God is speaking to and says, if you go over on a street called Straight Street, there's a man named Saul from Tarsus and he's praying and he's waiting for you to come. And Ananias, I love Ananias' answer. Ananias says, I want to go over there. Yeah, he questioned <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah. He was just going to say that. Yeah, mm -hmm. but he still went. He still went, but he questioned it. He, he said, question. God, this man yep. is, is, yep. is doing all sorts of things to people who love you. Why would I go and pray for him? He was questioning God. He I was don't asking like God this question. He said, why would I? He's, we, I know that he has come here to arrest us, to put us, to put me in jail. If I go and pray for him, I could go to jail. And God, I ain't sure I want to do that. And what does God say to Ananias? Tells him to go anyways. This man, he, he says, is he, he's a chosen instrument. This man is my chosen instrument. My chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and the kings and the people of Israel. So God tells Ananias, I've chosen this man and he's waiting for you to pray for him. He's waiting for you to pray for him. Because God said he had selected him and it was important for this person, Ananias, a disciple, to go and minister to Saul. I love that interaction between Ananias and Saul in verse 12, I think it is, of Acts chapter 9. So Ananias went to the house, and what did Ananias do? What did he say? Told him to restore his sight. How did he address him? He placed his hand and then restored his sight. What did he, what did he say? In, in 12, mm -hmm. in the vision, he seen a man. And verse 17, what does he say? Oh, okay. <laughs> he placed his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul. Mm -hmm. yep. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you, you know. Mm -hmm. so, so he calls him brother. Mm -hmm. brother, brother, he doesn't brother. call him you zealot, you Pharisee, you man that's coming to kill me and put me and my family in jail. You this horrific person. He doesn't even call him Saul. He greets him with love. He says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you told me to come here and lay hands on you to receive your sight and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Ananias, when God told him, this is my chosen instrument, he quit directly and then received Saul as one who was a part of the fellowship. Not as somebody who needed to be handled with kid gloves. Not as somebody who was awful, and Saul was doing awful things. But he didn't judge him in that fashion. He judged him because Jesus said, this is my chosen instrument and called him brother. The way we talk to people often indicates what we think about them and whether or not we see them as valuable to God. 
And in that interaction with Saul, Ananias wanted Saul to know that I know who you are and I know why you're here, but God has a plan for you. And you're my brother as we implement the God's plan for us. We don't know that much about Ananias after this. All we know that he was a disciple who obeyed what God asked him to do. Right. All too often, we need to be disciples who obey what God asks us to do. And when God tells us to speak to somebody, we ought to speak to them and not say, oh, they don't know me, or oh, I don't know them, or they're different from me. I don't they're want not, I don't want to. That's, that's the thing we do all the time. You're right. I don't want to. Can't you send somebody else? <laughs> I don't want to do this right now. And I am, I am, I marvel at Ananias' courage and his obedience to the word of God. Right. Yep. It takes great courage to go forward when you know your life can be in danger but obedience to them to the word of God because the people who were with Saul could also have arrested him. But here he addresses him and calls him brother and welcomes him into the family of God. I think one of the things you see as we continue reading in, in uh, Acts chapter 9 is that Saul spent several days there in Damascus and immediately joined the disciples and began preaching Jesus in the synagogues. And so this man who was had come to destroy was now building up the kingdom of God and preaching in the synagogue. And so there was confusion amongst the people. They didn't know whether or not to trust him, whether he was doing this to, to, to sort of lure people in and he could do some mass arrest. But Paul grew more and more powerful as the disciples there in Damascus supported him. I think that's the thing that as a gift, a talent that all too often we don't see in the church. What we have is this church supporting Saul through his transition and through his working and beginning his ministry. Understand that the minute Saul said, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, his whole life changed. He no longer had access to the synagogue. He no longer would be had the access to the connections that he had. His whole life was changing. And the fellowship there in Damascus supported him and protected him when people were trying to kill him. They left, they left Damascus after a few days, and then went to Jerusalem. And what happened when he got to Jerusalem? I think it's verse 25 or 26, verse 26. He had heard they were gonna try and kill him. Oh no, that's not. Right, so when yeah. he got to Jerusalem, he tried right. to join himself with the disciples. What did the disciples say? They were afraid of him. We don't want you. We heard what you tried to do. We don't want you. We don't believe that you're really a disciple. We are afraid of you. And so the disciples in Jerusalem, even though the people in Damascus had been supportive, when he got to Jerusalem, the disciples in Jerusalem, and who are the disciples in Jerusalem? Who's in Jerusalem? Are you talking about the Jews? Peter, James, oh, John. John. <laughs> These are the disciples who were in Jerusalem. When you talk about him, when he says here the disciples were afraid of him, it's these disciples who were there in Jerusalem. They were afraid of Saul. Oh, yeah, because they heard, you know, he had a reputation. He had a reputation, and they saw that reputation and went about with that particular reputation and didn't want to believe anything else. And they initially rejected him. But the third person I want us to look at is 
Barnabas. Verse 27 says, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and told them about Saul's conversion. He told them also that he had preached. Mm -hmm. Paul had preached. Fearlessly. Fearlessly how? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We meet, we meet Barnabas in Acts chapter 4, verses 36 and 37. We meet Barnabas in Acts chapter 4, verse 36 and 37. Verse 36 says his name, real name is Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means a son of encouragement, sold a field, and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas was a son of encouragement. His gift was to encourage and to support. And because the disciples trusted Barnabas, they allowed Saul to enter their company because this man spoke up for him. You'll see later on that, that Barnabas goes on a missionary journey with, with Paul. Mm -hmm. But it is his role as encourager, as supporter, as one who gets trustworthy amongst the disciples that helps Saul get acclimated with the believers there in Jerusalem. It is his role. Had he not been there, they would have still been afraid of him and ostracized Paul. And it would have taken a longer time for, Paul, for Saul to do the work that God had created him to do. But because Barnabas was present and because Barnabas allowed God to use him, he was able to bring forth and to help Saul develop his ministry and to maintain a connection with the people, with the, with the apostles in Jerusalem. What kind of gifts and talents must that be? Do you know I, about hmm? that point for sure? I didn't hear you. I said a highly necessary one. Highly I necessary. Right. And the church is in need of people who will encourage other people. Not that you have to ask them to do it, but it's their nature, it's their gift to spiritually encourage other people as they do the work that God has created them to do. Mm -hmm. And to help them fit in along the way. That's a, that's a, a gift that Barnabas, that's a role that Barnabas played. That's a role that the Holy Spirit in Barnabas uh, helped him play in the life of the early church. And although Saul, Paul gets all the accolades and he wrote all the books, if it wasn't for Barnabas, if it wasn't for Ananias, then Paul's mission would not have happened in the way that it did. But because God orchestrated the song says ordinary people who would interact with Saul along his way to becoming the great evangelist and gospel preacher that he became. These ordinary people helped Saul start his ministry. And it's because they yielded themselves completely to God that these things were able to happen. Not by accident. It's because people yield themselves completely to God and say, yes, God, you can use me. You can use my gifts, my talents, my abilities, whatever I got. I present my entire body as a living sacrifice to you. What does this say for you for our local congregation? Does this tell you? What does this, what? What does this say for us in our local congregation? Does this give us any indications of what we can or should do? 
Absolutely. We always encouragers. Yes, there's a role for each of us mm -hmm. at this point. You know, we we are not great in number at this point, but each one has a responsibility. Just a matter of figuring out what what role can I occupy to do the best that I can to be of help. We all have a role to play. Right. We all are essential. We all are vital to the kingdom of God. And I can't afford to say, oh, they don't, they don't, they, don't, they, they won't miss me. I don't we're have to. Small, but, mighty. but we're all important. Yes, we are. Yep. And we all play a role that God has designed at this moment in time for us to play. And what we have to do is decide, am I going to say yes? Or am I going to sit back and wait to be asked a third time? That's a decision we have to make mm -hmm. individually and collectively. That's a decision we have to make. I pray that we all make the right decision and say yes to God as he leads us along the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any questions for this evening? What? You know, I think weird things. Did saw have bad sight after the scales or before? Uh, I think he had bad sight before. Okay. <laughs> Things like that pop in my head. I don't know. I'm just kind of, I'm a wackadoodle. The only bad question is the one you don't ask. Yeah. But I think that this, this history of the early church is really vital for us as we all begin to see our own roles individually and collectively. Because what you see here is a group of people learning to work together for the good of God and the, the, the glory of the kingdom of God. And that, I think, is exciting to see. I will say overwhelming when you talk about like Saul or Job and how, how they were so faithful and so loyal it's a little overwhelming to think that I could be that way too. Ah, you can it's be. It's just an honest opinion. Hey, there's no telling what God has planned for you. Right. And I believe that God has got great things for you and all of us to do. And I'm excited to walk with you as we see it come to fruition. I'm going to be looking. It is exciting. Yep. It is. It is exciting. <laughs> it is exciting. Because I think there's a role for all of us to play. And I want us to walk in those roles as much as we can. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's have a word of prayer this evening. Heavenly Father, thank you for choosing us and selecting us according to your will. Thank you for what you've given unto us. Help us now say yes to you so that we might follow your will each and every day. Bless us now. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. Safe traveling tomorrow. Thank you.